Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and we are continuing our look at gliders and troop carriers and if you saw yesterday's show, it's very much an homage to the glider. Today is an homage to the people who were piloting the gliders, certainly in the British and Commonwealth armies. My special guest today is Mike Peters, who after 30 years in the British Army, including with the Army Air Corps, is now a full-time historian, author and battlefield guide and he's going to talk about the early formative years of the glider pilot regiment if you saw the show listing like a week ago we thought we were going to cover the whole thing but actually we're breaking it down to at least one maybe two maybe even three shows because there's a lot to cover so uh bring mike in good evening mike how are you today hi uh, paul good thank you thanks for having me on thank you for being here and as we as we just said there it, it's a big subject you know certainly if you go into it in some kind of level of detail but Last time you were on, you were talking about, you know, your 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 writing with Paul Bingley and looking at the Eighth Air Force. Um, do you have, you know, what have you been doing since then? Have you got any more books in the pipeline? Have you gone back into the British study of things? Or are you still looking at everything? Uh, well, I'm, so I'm working on the modern Army Air Corps history with John Greenacre. The, with, we're writing the operational history, and that'll be finished at the end of the year. And, and then I'm, I think I'm going to be dropping back into the glider pilot, uh, the glider world again after that is my next thought for the new year. Uh, so I've been talking to a few people about that and a, a little bit. I actually, yeah, been promoting the Bond Group book, but out with the fat, two fat lardies, wargaming, looking at the glider pilot figures and helping them with the rules for that. With uh, yeah, George, that was that was great. Rich, that was good fun. Um, and uh, there used to be battle on that that great diorama they've got. There. So right. weighing up the total soldier in twenty eight millimeter and the rules that reflected their characteristics. So clearly, you obviously think there's still things to be said about airborne operations generally, because I, you know, I get the accusations sometimes of what is there to say about airborne operations in Normandy or Market Garden. It's all been said in the hundreds of books. Clearly, you you would disagree with that. Definitely, I, I completely disagree with that. You know, both across the piece, U.S., German, British. There's more and more stuff coming out. Uh, you know, I, I just read uh, that that reprint of Gavin's diary. That was fascinating, mm. seeing how his his mindset changes from being a brigade commander or a regimental commander to when he commands the division. And some yeah. of the some of the things he says about the 82nd, how poor they are in Sicily and put the fingers he points. You know, and it's a great statement. That everyone thinks of him because of the um, Ryan O'Neill portrayal of British too far being anti-British. And he is to a point. He's an Irish-American after all. But um, he, he, there's a line in there he says, he, the first time he sees the Eighth Army soldiers, he says that they are the ultimate. That's what I want my troops to look like. They, they look like they're real soldiers, totally fit, well trained, disciplined. You know, just things like that. You just think, why isn't that out in the yeah. mainstream? Always yeah. new perspectives. Anyway, we're going to crack on with the glider pilot regiment. So you've sent me a PowerPoint. Tell me when to move on the slides. And folks, you will have questions, I'm sure, but I think a lot of your questions will be addressed as we go through it. So if we're talking about the formation, you're thinking, I want to ask something about Sicily. We will be getting to Sicily later on and we'll be getting you know, to various things. So feel free to fire away, but there's a chance it will be being covered. But over to you, Mike. Let's talk about the glider pilot regiment. OK, so I'm going to throw a grenade in right away because everyone knows I, I love the glider pilots. I knew, knew so many of them for you know most of my adult life. I've been around them and, uh, and edited their magazine, honorary member of their association, all those things. But, you know, I did learn a lot along the way from them, from their first-hand accounts and people like Arthur Shackleton and Mike Dauncey and all these different people about Chatterton, about Rock, about Sicily and all that. So I'm sort of throwing some of that stuff in there. And I've called this the wooden Excalibur because obviously the gliders are wooden, but, you know, we sort of think of the the airborne assault and the glider as the silver bullet, that you know, the, the glory of Arnhem, Pegasus Bridge, endlessly talk about Pegasus Bridge and nobody talks about... Ponte Grande, we're going to talk about tonight, and and um, even Horsebridge on the same night. So more of that. So uh, yeah, let's let's crack on. Now, I've got to touch touch base on this. Obviously, most people associate the birth of airborne warfare with Ibn Amel, Operation Granite, and Camp Through Cock, and you know ten gliders down, you know taking the most modern fortress in Europe and all of that. And that 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 does trigger or galvanise a movement that's already going, where, where most people are looking at airborne forces as a possibility. Uh, certainly UK, because of inter-service rivalry, it's not a real contender until the, until the Ebon ML happens and the Germans do what they do with, with Operation Granite. So let's move on. So that triggers um, what I call the genesis. And after an interminable wrangling between the Army and the Air Force, intervention by Churchill, you know, and, and then we finally get a formation of an Army Air Corps. And the Army Air Corps, not the one I, I was in, but the one before, 
uh, is the glider pilot regiment, is the parachute regiment, uh, administers the SAS and, and ends up administering the AOP squadrons as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a big administrative call rather than a fighting call. Uh, and I do like to point this out to all my parachute regiment friends, just check the dates on this order, who comes first. <laughs> so um, so we get that right. And so who had the maroon berry first? <laughs> right Who's got it now? So, yeah, so it's an important thing, but it, it is the long screwdriver from direct from the war office. Churchill, I want this. Make it happen. Make it so. And having seen some pretty disappointing demonstrations, he says, let's let's get this move. And um, one, of, one of the things I want to stress tonight is we look at airborne forces as part of this great narrative of World War Two as a long running thing. It's such a short window from May 1940, the first big coup de main, to crossing the Rhine, like March 1945, uh, for gliders, that's it. Yeah. It's over. And, and, and we, 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 put the, we put the microscope on the mistakes that happen along the way and say, oh, they should have done this and they should have done that with our 2020 hindsight. These guys are learning all of the time. Mm. Yeah, and, and the idea of tonight is to look at those early ones and see what, where, the, where the big mistakes were made. And, and do you think the ideas lead the tech or does tech lead the ideas or is it kind of a combination of of the two? I think it's a combination of the two because it's all new and it's what what can we do? I mean, who'd have thought of the Hamilcar in 1939 yeah. as, a, as, a, as an act of war? You know, who, who'd have thought that? Who'd have even thought of even a male with gliders, etc.? cetera? So, um, it, you know, and Eureka Beacons and Rebecca and all these things, that all, all, all that comes with gliders. So I think it's an exciting, it's an exciting thing, but you've only got to look at the end of the war the glider pilots are still kicking their heels in, in Palestine in 1947 as a theatre reserve for a strategic movement of troops. That's it. But they're, they're done. And mm. one thing before we move on to the slide is always bear in mind that once Operation Mercury goes, is that Pyrrhic vitrium in Crete, the Germans never entertain it again. And you see gliders being towed around to do resupplies and fighter squadrons with their own gliders with mechanics and spares. But... They're coming the opposite way down the street, the, the glider development street, to the Allies who are going up the other way. And, and of course, the, the governing factor is their superiority, air supremacy, because you yeah. can't operate the gliders without that. But um, so, yeah, so just keep that in your mind as we talk about this development phase, where the Germans are at the same time. So the classic thing which um, with my air corps routes that always comes out is, you know, these are soldiers in the cockpit. Or uh, coxswains, as the army called them at the start. They didn't even call them pilots. They were glider coxswains. And there's a big argument at the start between the Air Force and the, and, and, and the army. And at one point, they're talking about transport command or bomber command pilots flying gliders in their spare time in between ops. And of course, then when it comes out in the wash that these guys are going to have to fight on the ground as infantry, there's a, the first, there are actually 100 RAF pilots who are earmarked to be glider pilots. And they're less than enthused with the whole idea. And, and, of course, the man at the bottom of this paragraph, Arthur Harris, is even less enthusiastic about giving over his aircraft to tow things, or it's especially about giving over his air crew. So this is a quote from him talking about um, semi-skilled on infantry corporals even. And he, the Army still today trains infantry corporals to fly helicopters. Um, but they do, and they do do this thing. So, you know, the, the, the key thing is the Army's logic is when this thing lands, no matter how large or small it is, the only person who's in that aircraft is going to know exactly where they are, which direction the enemy are, where to go for them, is the pilot. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty important that the coxswain, the guy the coxswain knows what's, what's what what's going on around him. So they start to recruit these guys, and uh, you, you, you know, you've got the only people who can't join the glider pilot regiment are tank crews because they're a, a preserved species. They, they, they're needed where they are. Anyone else in the Army can apply to be a glider pilot. Cool stuff. So I hope I'm not teaching people to suck eggs too much, but the British Airborne Division of World War II consists of three brigades, one air landing and two parachute brigades. And it, and it comes into why gliders. The gliders give you heavy lift. You can move those Vickers guns and their ammunition, more important, most importantly, their ammunition. You can lift mortars. You can bring their ammunition in. You can move anti-tank guns. You can bring Jeeps. And with a hawser, you can bring the Jeep and the gun in the same glider, pretty critical. Um, you get an accurate landing, and even if it is inaccurate, you're all in the same place. I'm yeah. going to talk about Rock as opposed to paratroopers who aren't. We're going to talk, talk about Colonel Rock later. Yeah, he's involved very early in the design concept of the Hawser. The Hawser is designed to carry a platoon. 
The airborne platoon is the unit of currency, so it's designed to do that and carry a jeep and a gun. Uh, so that's what it is. So you, you're going to land your troops together, and you can get 60, nearly, or just under 70 gliders, get a complete battalion on the ground, and you can get them all together. Now compare that to a mass parachute drop uh, and all that goes with that. So you can see why, and also you've got this relatively silent approach that the noise signature, you can, you can cast off miles away at the right height and fly in silently. And of course, quite famously, George Chatterton, the CEO, offers this facility at Arnhem and is turned down as the risk is too high. He offers to land on the bridge. The bridge is so big, he says he can land gliders actually on the bridge. Uh, so they, these, that's, that, they, that's why gliders are important. And certainly in an airborne division, your two parachute brigades are your attack dogs. They're much smaller, much much more faster, but they're, they're not as well supplied. We all know the score. These two guys, the air landing brigade comes in with twice as many mortars per battalion, twice as many machine guns, and its own integral anti-tank guns, which the parachute battalions don't have. Uh, and in the early days, Mike, was this vision really quite clear? I mean, what, was there debate about this, or was it pretty much from the outset they said, this is what we're going to do, we're going to take platoons in, we're going to do this, or was there arming and ahhing? There was a, there was a lot, of, lot of debate, and uh, people like Lathbury, Legs Lathbury, who's the parachute brigade commander at Arnhem, and Browning, all these different people, they've all got their own views and ideas. Uh, and Rock famously says the idea of attacking a, a direct uh, airborne assault using gliders would be like a cavalry charge in three-ton trucks with canvas sides. It's, it's, it's just not going to be an act of war. So there's all these talks. The, the, the glider, right from the start, is uh, like British glider force is envisaged as a coup de main force and as a reinforcement force to reinforce an already established landing zone or drop zone. Mm. Super. Yeah. So the first... The first air landing brigade, uh, which we'll, we're talking about, is made up of some familiar names here. And it's interesting. I know we've talked about it before. We're um, first airborne division as it becomes and uh, sixth airborne division, the difference in mentality and the different units. But I always think that in both cases, the air landing brigades are pretty stable. Right. And, and, and are good at what they do, well organised and uh, the composition. So the air landing forces, I think, are the the steady core of both British airborne divisions uh, and their mentality and professionalism is is pretty impressive, actually, to, to be honest. And, you know, when, when these guys get on the ground, an, an, an air landing battalion that's got com basically an extra company, as I said, its own anti-tank guns, two machine gun platoons, two mortar platoons. Uh, so it's got double the firepower or quadruple the firepower of a parachute battalion. But the parachute battalion is designed to do something completely different. And is there a different mindset in the sense that the world over paras refer to themselves as paras maybe first before kind of ground soldiers, which comes kind of second on the list? It's the jumping out of the aircraft bit that is the bit the world uh, holds them to. Whereas with the air landing brigade, it is about the fact they are ground soldiers first who are, who are being delivered to the battlefield by glider. Is, yeah. Does it change the mindset? You could argue that the same that's true for both, couldn't you? And the same you you'll know from the, from the, the US mindset. It's the same the US glider infantry, you know, yeah. and US paratroopers is different different beast altogether. And even even the composition of these air landing battalions is it's a younger demographic. Uh, most of the parachute battalions are you know are, are second tour soldiers basically who've been somewhere else and really want to get in the fight and earn the extra money and have all the glory, et cetera. And a lot of the air landing battalions convert en masse and they use that opportunity to get rid of the dead wood and make it up with young soldiers. So the average age of an air landing battalion is much younger. Mm. Okay. Different mentality. And, and and now we have the, the, the disadvantages because, I, you know, it came up with, um, with Kevin, yes, it comes up frequently when we're talking about special operations is that, as I said in the show with Kevin, we like with gambling, we remember our, our successes, we forget our failures, is that airborne jumps, particularly parachute landings, as many of them go badly as go well. We look at World War II, we look at it on an international uh, 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 field. Yeah, and the same can be true of gliders. Certainly, we, we, we look at the blitzkrieg, and I've used this picture deliberately, and we think about how, how awesome the Falschenjäger were. The Dutch army made mincemeat of German airborne forces in 1940. You know, with, with the limited equipment they had, shot down numerous Ju-52s, killed numerous Falschenjäger, and, and, and did them a real good kicking. But we all think about Ibn Amel, and likewise my frustration about Pegasus Bridge being all that the glider pilots are remembered for, you know, it, it is, is equally irritating. So 
and certainly parachute landings are fraught with risk, uh, as we all know. And there's some, some of them are there. The noise signature of the air transport, the approach, the vulnerability of the air transport to flak, the paratroopers while they're in the air, the dispersion of a drop, the rally time that happens, you know. And you've only got to look at Merdell Battery as an example or Crete or whatever where, you know, separation from containers, dispersion of the drop, the lack of mobility if you're on the ground and you've been dropped in the wrong place. Because, you know, a parachute, a British parachute battalion, the only vehicles it's got are coming by glider. You know, it's only the only the US Airborne who drop their guns by parachute in pieces. We don't do that. We do it by glider. So it's um, it, it, the two things have got to work together and be coordinated. Mm, good stuff. So um, we're, go we're going to talk. We're here really to talk about the glider pilot themselves, the regiment. There's a nice bit of artwork there from the, that the recent French cartoon book that came out, which is they, they let me use. And it's a hot spare, which is almost a, a clone of the German DFS 230. And is initially thought it would be a a useful assault glider. It's too small. Yeah, it's 10 people again, same as a DFS, but it, it's quite a handy little training glider. And that's what we need at the start because we how do you how do you grow a capability overnight? Well, you know, when you start start the war with just 20 gliders. Um, so the, the hot spur is, is what it's about. And under the wranglings over and Churchill stuck his oar in and said there will be a glider pilot force. There will be and the, uh, the Air Force has given up arguing about it. it said okay the army can have army pilots and we will give you some tow aircraft. It, it, it really starts, and it's a real industry that, that happens next. If we move on to the next slide and start to move through there, it's, you know, and, and it's classic stuff at the start, and this is one of the points I wanted to make, is they, they view themselves as as uh, battalions. It's a regiment with battalions of glider pilots, and although they're, they're squadrons, not companies, the mentality is that. And, you, and talking to the early glider pilots, people like Jock East, who I spoke to, and people said when they went from on Solvent Plane, where their camp was, to to nether aid to fly they were driven by truck they got off the trucks they marched to their aircraft they got in their aircraft they flew they came back they marched away and didn't really have a lot to do with the royal air force crews that were towing them and flying and flying them around just their instructors so there was a very much a, a sort of a, a separate thing about this the, the RAF didn't really want to know the, the glider pilots and the glider pilots were being kept apart from them so um and that's going to manifest itself as, as a later on when things do start to go wrong that's one of the things that will be the catalyst for that okay. uh, but it's, it's a real big industry as you can see from this slide here thanks to matt yates and chalk uh, living history for this one he's modified a, a, a magazine article map and you can see down the left hand side there i've repeated the left hand side of the map the uh, all the training airfields where they are and the glider training schools and the efts is so elementary flying training schools is powered flying if you pass your selection and you get selected to be a glider pilot, you go off and you do the, the full Royal Air Force basic elementary flying training system. Uh, and then once you've done that, you can then move on to uh, glider training schools. And after that, you can get on to heavy, heavy glider conversion at Bryce Norton. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about the detail of that in, in the next few slides. But um, you can see it's quite an industry. Uh, and of course, it's interesting, Matt's put on the map here, the American airfields as well, which as you know from D-Day and, and Mark Garden, they're over more towards the Lincolnshire way and that side, Cotters more and places like that. And that's to de-conflict the two groups of airfields. to keep, And that's what causes the problems with north and south routes to Market Garden and all the other things that happen. Uh, and it's quite interesting to read Gammy's diary again, him talking about these airfields and Cotters more and places that he, he goes to in 82nd in Leicester. And all, the, and all these places that we just most people don't even know they were there. Mm. Uh, and down the left hand side, a lot of those airfields will, people will recognize as being still airfields or, or well known as airfields. And it came up in the sidebar yesterday, uh, with Kevin about people asking generally why were they using gliders that we're not going to use operationally, you know, the hot spur, the early ones for training. It seems ridiculous. And I, I wanted to say, but I was too busy hosting. but when you join the Royal Air Force, they don't let you loose on a Spitfire on day one or a land because, you know, you move up through various types of aircraft. That's the logical way of training. So it, it, yeah. I, I didn't quite understand the logic of some of those questions because if, you come, if you're bringing these recruits in from other regiments in the Army, 
Yeah. You you need to start with something, and I'm assuming the basic principles of you of, of flying a glider are are the same, regardless of which model it is. Is that is that pretty much true? Yes, yeah, which I mean, I did my flying my glider flying as a cadet, and and uh, yeah, it is. And it's a good, you start with a small one, and you work up to a big one. So you get the same as when you learn to drive. Yeah, it, still, and, and, and interestingly, they start they get their wings on powered aircraft first, so they get, you get to understand the principles of flight, and you right. get to go around again because you know flying a glider, as as Harris quite rightly said. You know, it's a one-way thing. You need to get it right. So you need yeah. to be a good, good aviator point. to do that. And especially when you've got, you know, 20-odd 20, 20 blokes in the back or a Jeep and whatever. So um, it's really important to, to develop that training, uh, that, that pipeline. It has to be well done. And well, credit to Chatterton, who we'll talk about later, and Rock. They both insisted that the, that the full Royal Air Force syllabus was done. Mm. So... The glider, the glider pilots, when they got the wings, elementary basic flying wings, were the same, had done the same training as every RAF pilot. Mm. Um, so, and we'll were, bring up this slide now because, again, I don't want to go down another rabbit hole, but yeah. I think we talked about this idea, and we've got Scott McGough on tomorrow talking about the American glider pilots. Yeah. Is this 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 myth has not has has spread of glider pilots being badly trained and the least? Yeah, you know, oh, it's spread excellent. from America. To Britain, to everywhere now, and that there's yeah. this perception generally that glider Big pilots splash. are hopeless. They've had two minutes yeah. flying. I don't know where it starts from, but it's it's ridiculous, isn't it? And, you know, it and, got its roots. I think it's got its roots in the Norway and Sicily debacles that we're about to talk right. about. But also, you know, this thing about oh yeah, we crashed. You know, and I heard someone today on I think it was Kevin or you said uh, yeah, you said I think uh, about um, being pushed off a cliff edge in a garden shed when he asked yeah. You said, Sorry. And uh, and um, okay, in some of the pla some places they, they did crash. Pegasus Bridge is an example where you know they deliberately ripped the wings off, deliberately smashed. That was a special forces operation yeah. essentially. And uh, but the, the whole thing about Mallard and Tonga was as you, you know the ground well. Great big open spaces. You can land whole battalions, and there's great photographs of Arnhem, sixty-seven gliders in one field, a complete battalion delivered to the same field in minutes. On the wheels, you know, and the whole point about the hawser is that it's got good wheels and brakes, etc., and it and, and it can do all that. So um, yeah. the idea is to deliver people I mean, again. It, as I said yesterday, you remarked on it. It seems that we're stuck with this with, with the two extremes. We're stuck with the you can either glide glide land, glide land gliders on a sixpence, the Pegasus Bridge kind of thing, or they're hopeless and they crash. And it seems and, and those are both extremes that existed. But actually, there's this whole bulk in the middle. That we seem to be overlooking, you know, that you know, pi the pilots are either incredibly well, well trained, like Jim Walworth, or they know nothing. And I don't know why we're stuck. It's the binary world we live in, I guess, isn't it? Everything well, you, has you, to be the extremes. You do know which, which pilot landed the furthest away from Ponte Grande Bridge in, on, Sic on the island of Sicily, over sixty miles away, Jim Walworth. Okay. <laughs> yes, I didn't know he was the furthest. I knew he wasn't yes, close. But yeah. Yes, so I, I, I told when I did the research with Sicily book, and I, I knew Jim. And I said, "Oh, it's, it's, I've just faced it. I was hoping nobody'd ever bloody find that." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, you, yeah, but you know, it, that's not his fault. He's at the mercy of the truck pilot. Yeah, yeah. It's simple, simple as you know, as every glider pilot was. But here's the, here's the training, and you can see the flight time photograph there. And I think it's a great photo because if you look at the the army guys, the glider pilots, you've got their converted crash helmets, motorcycle crash helmets on, and the uh, the, the RAF instructor there and his nice soft forage cap and his urban jacket and the, all the right gear. So that, there's the nothing to ever change, does it? So, but you can see they aim at the start that it's it's an 11 week basic training cycle, which is reduced to 11 as the training command improves its output. And they're using this Tiger Moth. Which is a Philip West Christmas card. I just love it so much, uh, and the Magister. Uh, and then you get once you get through, you've got your wings on Magister and Tiger Moth, etc. You then go off from ET EFTS, um, so to uh, GTS. And there's all kinds of interesting people around these places. Like um, the guy who wrote Sag Sagittarius Rising, Cecil uh, Lewis. He he's an instructor at an EFTS, teaching glider pilots to fly Tiger Moths. Imagine having him as your instructor. <laughs> Amazing. And um, so, and then you get the GTS, and basically a course of glider pilots is 66 strong. You're there for three weeks. You work five and a half day week, and you do 33 flights, 33 sorties and landings, which includes formation flying, uh, tactical landings, etc. And the whole course all, between all 66 of them will will log a com combined total of 2,000 landings. So that's 2,000 takeoffs in three weeks from, that, from wow. each airfield. 
So it's quite intense. That's 180 sorties per day. So you can see from that standing start where Churchill says, this is not good enough. When the RAF do embrace it and do start the pipeline and start training these guys, they really go for it. You know, and at the peak of peak of training output, even even after Arnhem in 1945, there'll be two and a half thousand glider pilots. Wow! But uh, but a lot of those guys were, were a caveat. We'll, we'll find out in later talks. Will be Royal Air Force guys who are backfilling okay. after the losses at Arnhem. Um, so it's it's quite a it's quite a decision to do. It. But we'll only ever have enough pilots to fly one airborne division at a time. There's no shortage of gliders because we can make those. But making the pilots is the, is the is the blockage. So so that's why you get those guys, the glider pilots whizzing back from Normandy after forty eight hours to be ready to fly first airborne as a reinforcement if they have to. Uh, so so it's quite a production line. Yeah. So come on. Yeah. Now this is where you get into, and I know Al Murray and Co. They they talk about this a lot, and Kev does, and all. Yeah, Kev gets talks about it. The guy on the left is George Chatterton. The guy on the right is is uh, Colonel Rock. What a great name. Uh, and and they, they d- d- divide opinion. All of the glider pilots I knew had very polarised opinion on these two guys. Uh, and let's talk about Rock first. So he's the first commanding officer of the glider pilot regiment. He's a rural engineer. He's a charismatic leader. He speaks four languages. He's an engineer. He studied in Germany before the war. And he wants to be a pilot. Uh, and he he's a he's a I'll do everything first. I won't ask you to do anything. You I'll, you to do anything. I will do myself. And it, consequently, when one of the parachutes has been trialed because he's involved at Ringway, uh, is deemed to be dangerous. He says nobody's going to jump with this thing apart from me. And he does, and he's dragged along and trashed by it, very badly injured in hospital for six weeks. But all the glider parts I spoke to who who served with him absolutely love this guy because he was one of them. He's on the first glider pilot course. He's there all the way. Chatterton, completely different animal. He's a pilot who wants to be a soldier. Uh, you might just make it out on his on his breast there. He's wearing Royal Air Force wings. He's a pre-war Douglas Bader era fighter pilot. Right. Reached through the number one squadron and is involved in a mid-air collision, invalided out and joins the Queen's Regiment on outbreak of war and um, goes goes in the 1940 campaign, but he's, he's still flying it and comes back into it. And they, they start their relationship as... Rock as commanding officer, Chatterton as his second in command. And in 1942, they will there'll be two glider battalions, and Chatterton will just about to be moved to move over to take over the second battalion. And, and Rock, Rock is big into flying. He said, "This is about flying. I need my guys to be fantastic pilots." Chatterton is yeah, they can be pilots, but when they get on the ground, they're going to have to fight. So they need to, and they need to be able to do any handle any piece of equipment that's in the back. They're all senior NCOs, so I want them to be really good pilots and able to fight. This this is where this total soldier idea comes from, which is not talked about much at the time. You can see it in the newspaper in 1945. But but this this is these are these are points taken directly from Chatterton, um, and he he's he's very very big into drill and turnout. He brings guards, sergeant majors in to train the glider pilots. And it's another way to thin out the abundance of recruits. They've got too many people. They can't train them all. So it's fail people or whatever you can and take the cream. And uh, so you can see there, bearing, saluting and drill, because he thinks, any, he's so impressed with the guards, he thinks, and he's gone to Eton and he's big friends with Browning. And he wants to build this, this force of total soldiers who can do anything as well as the RAF, but can do anything on the ground as well. So this is where they, they, they clash the two the two clashes as CO and, and two IC. So we've got. And we're getting questions, Mike, about yeah. the target while they're coming in. So Sean Brennan is saying yeah. you are speaking about the extensive training the glider pilots got, and mentioned the glider is reliant on tow aircraft to get to target. How much training do tow aircraft crews get in glider ops? And Great Dominion is saying it seems to me there's too much focus on the skill of glider pilots and far too little on that of the tug crews. So as two people have asked it. What's your reaction to that? Well, I'm here to talk about glider pilot <laughs> but, right. but but we will get into the tugs because when we when we move on to the actual operations, tug, the tug factor will come out. So I promise I will address those two those two points. Okay, cool. And it, it's a big factor right from the start is prizing these tug tug crews away because they're not just tug crews. They don't just tow gliders. They they're bomber crews at the start. 
their uh, training command crews, their, instru- their flying instructors, some of them flying bombing missions, some of them are supposed to do other resupplies. As the war goes on, the same Sterlings that are towing the gliders are doing parachute resupply. Uh, and um, probably dropping sea mines, as Jane told yeah, us about a few exactly. weeks ago. So, yeah, yeah, pulling them away from the, the 101 the, things they've got to do. Yeah. We'll see 38 group and 46 group later in the war. But at this stage, we're using bombers from 38 wing, which we'll talk about in a minute. So, yeah, fair okay. point. So uh, back to the development. So rock yeah. dies, uh, trialing a, a classic rock. They're, uh, they're trialing a night landing a night landing design, device of three lights out on Salisbury Plain. The idea being a ground party of Pathfinders would put that on the ground for a coup de main party to fly in at night and gliders. One of the guys is his aircraft, aircraft's a bit light. Rock's watching the trials. Says, I'll come with you. So he jumps in the back. They go off and, and uh, the, the glider crashes. Uh, the, the pilot in the front is thrown through the nose and out through a, a hot spur. And Rock is crushed by the sandbag bag, bag, uh, bag ballast that's in the back of the uh, glider. It slides forward, it crushes him, and he's rushed to Tidworth Hospital. He spends a few days there before he dies of peritonitis from internal bleeding, etc. Yeah. Which leaves the field open for Chatterton to become CEO of both battalions and ultimately to become what's called Colonel Glider Pilots. Right. So a lot of the guys, and this is worth bearing in mind, a lot of the guys are would call themselves I'm a rock man, not a Chatterton man at the time. I mean, it was never massively divisive, but you know, there, were, there was always a, an opinion. Everyone had an opinion on Chatterton or rock. Uh, and, and as I say, one's a soldier trying to be a pilot, one's a pilot trying to be a soldier. And that I makes perfect sense. And I'm assuming the people in the regiment would divide themselves in those same kind of categories. Some they saw would. them as uh, as ground yeah. soldiers who flew aircraft, and some have thought themselves as pilots. I mean, imagine, who... imagine yourself as a corporal in the tanks or the infantry, or well, not the tanks because you weren't going to get all the guns or whatever, and you, you've you always wanted to fly. The war breaks out and you're stuck on some gun park at Lark Hill. And somebody comes along and says, yeah, you can go be a pilot. And, and, and they all said it to me. They all said, it was fantastic. We, got to, we learned to fly. We got extra money. Uh, we, we stayed in a, in, a, in a sergeant's mess that had sheets, you know, and all, and all of this. It's fantastic. What, what more could a, a young corporal want in, yeah. in 1942? Absolutely. So, and, you, and you get a red berry and, uh, and we're the Pexis and your wings. Yeah. So we're um, moving into operational use now. So, um, yeah, yeah, so that's, let's Freshman. talk about those now uh, because um, Operation Freshman, as many of your viewers will know, is, is the raid on the heavy water plants in Norway. Which takes place in, 19, in November 1942. There's only two gliders and two tugs involved, two Halifaxes uh, uh, flown by uh, British and Canadian pilots. And the two gliders, one is flown by two army pilots, which are in the picture, and the other, other second glider is flown by uh, two uh, Australian Air Force pilots, um, Frank Herbert and Colin Davies. So Malcolm Strafty and Doig are on the very first pilot's course, a glider pilot's course. They're not ready. And the mission to, to fly to Norway, 400 miles in poor visibility, relying on a Eureka beacon. But that's that's the nature of the beast. That was, you know, this is so vital. We've got to stop the Germans getting the A-bomb, etc. So two gliders towed by 238 wing Halifax uh, take off and uh, straight away, having circled the departure airfield at Wick for quite a while, so uh, we, we've got to go now. The weather's only going to get worse over the next few nights, so we'll, we'll go now. And when they get to the Norwegian coast, they uh, have one flies low, one flies high to get through the coast, through the cloud. The Eureka beacon has failed. And uh, ultimately, uh, only only one Halifax will get back. The, the unfortunate thing, this, here we see um, a, Halif- a Halifax towing a hawser in what's called the high tow position. So you, as a glider, you fly high or low. You don't fly directly behind a four engine bomber because of the turbulence. So, And you're communicating via a telephone cable along the tow cable there. And, and the rear gunner is the is the link. And uh, at this stage, the 38 wing guys are doing all the trials. It's a very new concept for the RAF, as well as it is for the army. And the two the two things are critical. You can't do one without the other. But no one as it'll take more than this catastrophe to make people realise that uh, there's they need to work the things together far more far in a far more joint way. So what you see is the two two gliders get take off with fifteen sappers on board each, and unfortunately for them, it's a month after the famous Führer Commando order is issued in October forty two. Mm. 
So when the two gliders come down, all four glider pilots are killed outright in the crash. They're not captured. And uh, but those that do survive are are executed by the Germans. And, um, and one of the Halifaxes also crashes and all seven are killed. So 41 people are killed and only seven get back, which is Group Captain Cooper, who goes on to be one of the leading lights in, in 38 Group, as it will become, and learns a huge amount from this mission about, you know, why why did we do it this way? Uh, why were we rushed into this? And uh, Because, you know, it, it was a one-way ticket for the gliders. If they'd have, if they'd have managed to carry out their mission, their, their, their evasion, evasion route, was out through neutral Switzerland, Sweden. Sorry, not Switzerland. It's a long way to Switzerland. Uh, and, and, so, and cycled to Sweden, if I if I remember correctly. Which yeah, in the they winter, were, so, they, were, they were really really risky. They were going to go do that in civilian clothes as well. Mm. Uh, so you know they were they were on a hide to nothing if they were captured. But and, but uh, you know given it's given it it's very unique nature this operation. And, and we'll move to the next slide. Is it really considered part of the glider? methodology or is it is it too different and too 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 small in a sense to be really part of the main the main um development most people don't count it they think right. of it as a, as a special forces type operation and a needs must because paratroopers wasn't we're, we're not going to work in that environment they have to get the stuff there get the explosives there so gliders was hey we've got these gliders let's let's try let's try them uh, so but, it's, seen, know, it's seen as a commando mission that used gliders yeah. rather than a glider yeah. operation. It, it yeah, and, and there's more of that later in the war in, in, in the, the Balkans and, and yeah. the Mediterranean yeah. using WACOs um, to do that, or the X squadron. So um, there is there is a, a, a specialist element to it, but the, the main force is to move one of those airborne divisions in a mass heavy lift carrying heavy equipment. So there's a, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, I mentioned on the, on the, the social media the, the poster that we we stuck out there with the recruiting poster. Here's the guy who's actually in the poster. This is Cliff Wedge, Cliff Wedgbury, who goes on to become a staff sergeant, and this is him posing for a photo shoot, uh, and he he will feature in, in the poster. Um, and, and even at this very early stage, there's a realization that we we need crews. We need a first pilot, a second pilot. Although nobody's got any more hours than anyone else to be senior. So, and the idea is already growing. Staff sergeant, first pilot, sergeant, second pilot, and a, a, a few officers in a squadron of glider pilots. Right. So it, it it is a race. There's a lot of pressure to to build the whole airborne capability, but also to make sure that there's a really good, uh, capable and rugged air landing capability within that. And obviously, you can't do that without pilots. So there's a lot of pressure right. to, to produce these glider pilots. And the, the second pilot wings are the lower set. They'll basically do the whole syllabus, but they'll learn to fly horses on the job at the squadron. Their heavy right, gliding okay. version will be with the squadron. Okay. Um, so that really kicks in because everyone, everyone is, even in 1942, thinking about Overlord, Neptune, and all this. And it's okay, we're going to need more pilots. We're going to need, and the Americans have the same problem. They decide they're going to have 10,000 so they can fight the Japanese and and the Germans at the same time. And you'll hear all about that tomorrow. So I won't, I won't steal the sandwiches for tomorrow night. Okay, so uh, well, off off to Husky, which is 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 a is a minefield, literally and figuratively, in terms of of, of airborne operations, all that can go wrong, and all that you know. And so, uh, over to you. Yeah, so I mean, I, I won't talk about Husky in in any great detail, other than it, 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 after North Africa, we have to do something. Uh, and um, th by this stage, the U.S. Airborne are on the scene. Eighty second Airborne has been created and uh, is uh, is in north africa um first airborne that the red devils have been fighting in north africa and have got their nickname and etc so and it's what are we going to do how are we going to do this and there's the, the man who never was and all this stuff around sicily and there's got to be a role for airborne forces in this and the, the assessment is that the italians have fought so well in north africa that they're going to fight equally hard to defend their homeland surely so we need to make sure we've got a huge force and we're going to use our our airborne divisions to protect our flanks. And we're going to come up with an idea. And this is what I find fascinating about Sicily. It says, oh, you're always talking about Sicily. This is 11 months before Normandy. And it's all the same people. Yeah. Montgomery, Bradley, Eisen Eisenhower's the Supreme Commander, although he's very ineffective because he's stuck in Malta. He learns so much from this. All the airborne commanders are here. Everybody is here. Is here. Um, and, and involved in it, and, and a lot of the technology and a lot of the mistakes that are made here will obviously be 
corrected and made good for for Normandy. And everyone knows that that's where the, the invasion stripes come from, from the, the, the flat canal kind of identification problems here uh, during Sicily. So let's move on to, so here we go. This might ring a few bells. It, it, what we're going to do is have an airborne carpet and, it, and it's all going to be a question of bridges. So you can see a series of operations are planned here. If you look at, imagine Sicily, the island as a, as a, as a triangle, if you just go back a slide for a second, Paul, you can see on the right-hand side there, Catania. And basically the concept of operations is that the British and Canadians will drive up that right-hand coast, the Catania plain, straight, straight to the top right-hand corner and, and take the straight to Messina. And the Americans under Patton, who are very new on the block, according to the British anyway, and will protect the will protect the flank of that. And that's where 82nd Airborne will find themselves out, out, out to Jeddah and beyond. The 1st Airborne will seize the bridges to allow the armoured thrust to go from south to north of that right-hand strip of the of the island where the, where the mount on the flat plain of Catania. Okay. But, do you, but, you know, I'm kind of being devil's advocate here because you, you, you said earlier about, the, you know, the, which came, well, I asked you about which came first, the ideas or the tech. Um, we know with Overlord in Normandy later on, the, the airborne part of it is is integral to the entire scheme. It's it, it's in at the beginning. So yeah. Are you are you kind of suggesting that the airborne model was fitted to Husky because you've got airborne forces rather than uh, the rather than them them being needed as such? Is that are you, am well, I, they, are they going that far? They are, they are needed because. Sicily is the size of Switzerland and there's a lot yeah. of coastal defences and we don't know how good they are or how bad they are or whatever. So there is a need to neutralise coastal batteries uh, so that the naval force can get in and land the troops for Husky. And that's where uh, Operation Ladbrook and the other associated operations come along. And there's also, rather like the coins burning a hole in your pocket that Eisenhower talks about for the market garden, there's a, we've got these divisions, we need to use them. Yeah, and there's yeah. also the politics of hey, we are these divisions, you need to use us. And there's people like the Special Raiding Squadron, et cetera, trying to justify their existence. Things that worked in the deserts are not necessarily going to work in Europe. Yeah, so of course. Fighting, yeah, yeah, yeah. fighting for a piece of this, this operation to make sure that they retain their existence. And in the case of British 1st Airborne Division, it's to prove that they have a right to existence because all they've done so far is freshmen. Yeah, You've got all these no, that's a very good point. I mean, we, we know that all you know all the various special forces that were in North Africa, not all of them survive out of North Africa, and their commanders are sort of camp, camped outside high commands, offering their services to to prove their worth. I, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, after after this, the glider pilots after Sicily find themselves sent to Taranto to occupy Taranto on the same ship as Popsky's private army. Yeah, yeah, both yeah. being used as regular infantry. So, and as, of course, there's a massive shortage of infantry in the, the British and Commonwealth forces in 43 anyway. But there's a, there's a real desire to make this work. And we'll get into the, some yeah. of the commanders and what they try to do. But basically, keeping in mind that the Germans have, have binned all this. They're, they're not doing this anymore. <laughs> they're going to use their, their airborne forces in Sicily as a reinforcement tool, but they're not going to be doing assaults like we're talking about here on a huge scale. So we've got uh, Ladbrook. Glutton, which won't happen, and Fusty, that, that will happen, and they're all they're all linked to the amphibious landing and this drive up the Catania plane. Eighty second Airborne will be doing their own thing out on the other flank, rather similarly to, to Normandy. Okay, so that's uh, but all of the time, even at this stage, Browning, who was in North Africa preparing for Sicily, he's already been sent back, and we know that things like landing. L L LCLs, LCTs, all the different ships and all the equipment's already being drained away from the Mediterranean to, to be prepared for Overlord. And Browning's gone. He, he was in command of the division. He's now gone back to make sure that 6th Airborne Division is fronted up properly and that there'll be an airborne corps and to plan the European, North, Northwest European operations for airborne forces. So let's, um, let's move on. Right, here we come. So this is this is the Browning's replacement. This is Hopkinson, General Hopkinson, who is who was commander of 1st Air Landing Brigade and moves up to take over the Airborne Division. And, he's, and you can see he's wearing one of the uh, Bakelite Army Air Corps cap badges. So a lot of the um, mm. infantry battalions, etc., wore the Army Air Corps cap badge. Uh, some of them, the parachute battalions, made their own. They were given a, a, a shape to copy and they carved their own because there were no, no metal, no Bakelite. So Hopkinson is a complete glider fanatic yeah. and he wants to be the first commander 
on the Allied side to use gliders on a large scale in an offensive role. Uh, he flies gliders himself. He's big buddies with one of the glider pilot regiment squadron commanders, he, and he flies with him later in the campaign. And actually, when when Husky go, when Labrook goes in, he flies in the front of a glider. And the controversy will come when he decides that rather than use paratroopers to take the coast and, and glide us further inland, he wants to use gliders first because he wants to be in the glider and he wants to use gliders before anybody else. So, and probably doing him a disservice because he's not here to def defend himself. And after the war, he, he died in, 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 on mainland Italy, picked off by a sniper standing on a jeep bonnet watching an attack go in. So he's not, he was never around to defend himself. So what I'm going to talk to you about now, we need to bear in mind that there are two sides to this story and we've only got, we've got lots of witness statements, but we haven't got Hopkins's own view on this, what happened. Fair enough. So he's quite a feisty guy. So let's talk, let's nip back to UK for a minute. So the glider pilots, been, we've been churning out glider pilots at quite a rate. However, we haven't had as many gliders as we, as we, we need. And some of them haven't flown for three or four months. And by the time they get to North Africa, some of them won't have flown for six months. So they need a minimum of 30 hours a month to stay current. And they, they haven't had that. So they've done their basic training. They've done elementary flying training. They've got their wings. They've flown heavy gliders. And then they've not seen one again. So And then they're going to be shipped out to, uh, to North Africa to operate uh, as part of Operation Labrook. So just keep that again in your mind right. as to the, their readiness state, okay? And now we have the issue of the gliders themselves. Yeah, because we're, we're talking about planning this in January 1943, uh, and the operation will go in July, possibly earlier is the thought. And, and to move the, the, a battalion, you need 67, 68 gliders. And... Um, there isn't the space. There isn't. There aren't the ferry aircraft to get them to North Africa, so we can't fly them there on mass. And the shipping is already allocated to all the other stores and supplies. It's, it's large. It's big, it's a bigger armada than Normandy, Sicily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, every ship taken up from trade, every merchant ship is already on its way there, already loaded or whatever. So we have a problem. How are we? Get, we've got these glider pilots. We've got an airborne division. We haven't got any gliders. So what to do? And that's a, that's a glide, quite a well-known photograph now, which uh, we found when we did the Arnhem book, which basically shows the 35 major components of a Horsa glider. Notice there's a lot of women there were involved in building it. A lot of furniture makers and coffin makers and people like that are involved in, in building the horse, which is a fantastic aircraft, which we heard about all last night, so I'm not going to talk and enthuse any more about it, but um, it's a great aircraft. So quite, the problem is how to get them to, um, to North Africa. So we move on. Well, we, perhaps we don't need to because it turns out that the uh, the Americans, God bless them, have just happened to have 370 G4 Waco gliders stored in West, stored in West Africa on, on their route to somewhere else. And they can be delivered by sea or by air um, or by road or train by the US Army Air Force to Morocco where the glider pilots are staging themselves. And I say Waco because everyone calls it the Waco and um, it's not. It's it's the it's actually an abbreviation. It's not Waco, Te Texas. It's the Weaver Aircraft Co Corporation of Ohio who built it. The Brits call it the Hadrian because we have to rename everything. We've mm. got a Horsa, Saxon. We've got uh, that we call this the Hadrian, and it's a great little aircraft. Um, if you are if you're the Americans, because you're going to train ten thousand pilots, you want something that's really easy to fly, and you can use all your aluminum. To to Frank, it's the Brits haven't gone any of that, and you can use your. Well, you've gone fully, fully, fully transatlantic today, Mike. I mean, I am, I am. <laughs> and you know, General uh, Hap Arnold says, uh, originally he said, I, I, "I build me a jeep that can fly." American mm. loose guy, thinking pardon the pun, he says, "I want a jeep that just flies." So they can't quite even the Americans can't manage that, but they do come up with this wacko that can carry a jeep or a gun. Critically, not the two together. Point for later. Um, so, um, but. Um, they start to deliver these aircraft in crates to the uh, staging airfields where the Brits are and um, with the instruction manuals and a few mechanics who are black mechanics because the, the Negro soldiers of the day are segregated and they turn up and say, we're here to show you how to build the gliders. 
So you're a glider pilot who've not flown for six months. You've never seen a wacko. And you are living in pretty tough conditions, exposed to all the elements and the heat and dust and sandstorms, etc., on a desert airfield. And you're going to build your own glider and then test fly it. Not an approved mechanic. You're just going to build it yourself. But you do have the incentive that once you've built one, you can live in the crate. Ah, yeah. So, yeah. So there's, you know, these, these boys had it quite tough. <laughs> and the, those that were there talk about it, say, oh, were, you, were you in North Africa? They used to say the old boys and say, no, you, you haven't lived unless you lived on that desert. But they did it. They, they got a production line set up. Each squadron built its own gliders. And Hopkinson enthused, enthusiastically supported them. And then you, you got to test flight and some American glider pilots turn up and their part in all of this is completely under underwritten, under, sorry, underplayed. They come along, send their some gliding instructors in and they train the trainers. They train some of the senior glider pilots to fly and instruct other glider pilots. And basically, it's a completely different aircraft to fly. As you heard last night from, from Kevin, it, it's more of a hover. It, it comes down very, very slowly. Um, I'd say it's inferior. It had its it had its use, and it, it, it would have been ideal for the Far East, etc. It's much smaller. Uh, it couldn't carry as much, uh, and critically, its maximum tow speed was 150 miles an hour, which was just just um, below, so just above the stalling speed of an Albemarle. So if a RAF Albemarle had to tow a wacko, the wacko would be going full full pelt. And the album was always almost stalling. So mm-hmm. there were all kinds of problems with headwinds, etc. So think about that as a as a problem. Yeah, yeah. So um, especially when you're going to do what they're about to do. So that's the the wacko, uh, which came down very gently. It was a, a, a horse, as, as many viewers will know, would dive down and had barn door size flaps. It could land in a very short space of time. This thing was designed to be easy to fly because they, they didn't have, they weren't building training total soldiers for their pilots. They were training air force pilots. To fly a glider and then be carried home to, to go and get another glider. Um, so, so, so it's not it's not just the, the change of glider; it's a change of doctrine. The change of uh, of the whole concept is different. It's, its handling characteristics are totally different. For those who've glided, the, the Waco has spoilers, whereas the glider's got so the, the horse has got huge, great big barn door flaps which drop down and break the airflow and allow you to dive and stop very quickly. The Waco has flaps, but it, it has air brakes on top. So basically, you come down very gently, very steadily, which is great if you're a student pilot. That's what the kind of glider I learned to fly in. But it's not so good if it's hot landings only being fired at and you want to get down really quick. Right. Okay. So, yeah. But easy to fly. And the, you can see them there about to put a D7 bulldozer in, the, in it there. But you hooked the vehicle to a cable. When it landed, the pilots jumped out, lifted, and the vehicle drove out. And the nose lifted automatically like Thunderbirds, and you just drove out on the cable and drove away. So Hap Arnold nearly got his Jeep that flew. So, but that's the wacko. Right. And they're they're building them as we go. Here's the album all. And for our tug questions, here we are. We're talking about 38 wing RAF, who were the nucleus of what would become 38 Group with a multitude of towing aircraft. And this was a problem because they all had different power outputs and different handling characteristics. So if you're gonna, we could not fly in tight formation with our gliders like the Americans did because they had the DC-3, C-47, all the same type. So they could fly in streams, VIX, whatever they wanted to do because everyone was flying at the same speed, same capabilities. We had Albemarles, Sterlings, Halifaxes, you know, all these different aircraft, all different stages of maintenance and capability. So we tended to fly in streams. Right. Same as our bomber command thing. So that direct, the tech directly affects the doctrine there. Okay. The yeah, Albemarle. Pretty do- ropey bomber, but quite a handy little aircraft tug, which will see us r- right through to the end of the war. Okay, Operation Turkey Buzzard. Right, so Turkey Buzzard, oper- its official name was Operation Beggar. And this is the m- operation that will um, move those gliders, 40 gliders is what they're after, to 40 horse gliders from UK, from the airfield at Port Reith in Cornwall, for those that know it, the furthest south they could possibly get as a, a, land- a departure point and get them to Morocco. Um, so, and this is 38, 38 wing really doing their stuff, these tug pilots. So they, they do a trial, they, they get given the problem, get these horse gliders to North Africa. They go to 295 squadron, uh, nether even. They think, how can we do this? So they, they strip out the mid upper turret, they strip out the nose turret, they open the bomb bay, stick a fuel tank in the bomb bay, 
put fuel wherever they could. They only keep the, the rear turret for defence and to communicate with the glider. And they go, they go and fly around UK and time themselves and record how they can do to make sure that they can get over 3,000 miles or whatever they need to do to get to Morocco. So if we move on to the next slide. So here we go. The requirement is to move 40 gliders. And we want the hawsers because all of the operations we're going to do, uh, Ladbrook, Fustian and Glutton, need six pound anti tank guns for the airborne forces. So only, there's uh, no pier yet. Uh, so they need they need those. And also we need to do coup de main where we can land platoons directly on a position which the WACO can't do for us. So ultimately, they managed to scrabble together 36 gliders, gliders with crews and 10 Halifax tugs which have been modified and done the trials. And they're going to fly a 1,350-mile transit to Morocco to get the glider there in the first place. Then they're going to do a transit across Morocco to get into the staging airfields. And then they're going to fly the gliders over the Atlas Mountains into Tunisia for the jump-off point. Now, if you look at the map on the right, they're the routes they flew. If you know your World War II history, you'll know the Bay of Biscay is quite a dodgy place to be if you're in anything, any Allied aircraft or ship, because it's well within the range of Fock Wolf Condors, JU-88s, U-boats, and anything else. And uh, the Spanish coast is not a friendly coastline, really. It might be neutral, but it's not friendly. So you're, you're going to be asked to fly a, a horse glider across the Bay of Biscay. The good news is we're going to give you a Bren gun for defence, and uh, because the horse has got firing ports on it, and in the in a middle position in the middle of the wings and in the tail, and and the doors are designed to be open so you can fire a Bren gun out the side. So that, that's fine against the Ju88. Not. We'll give you an extra pilot, three pilots per horse, because it's so manually tiring to fly, physically tiring to fly a, a horse. No assisted controls to fly all that way. But don't worry, we'll give you an RAF fighter escort of bow fighters from Port Reith as far as we can. But that means because we don't want them to be shot down on the way back because they've been picked up on by, by radar, where they've got to you've got to fly away top height until the fighters go. So you're gonna fly in a horse glider behind a Halifax in broad daylight at wave top height with a, a, a with the threat of JU 88s and Fock Wolves to, to think to think about. And you want good weather to get there. But you don't want good weather because then you could be seen. What you want is cloud because the standing operating brief for the for the, the Halifax tug combination from the 38 wing guys is if we get in trouble, we'll try and evade, we'll try and fly into the nearest cloud bank. We've only got the, the rear gunner, that's all we've got defense wise. And we'll try and lose the Fock Wolf with the JU 18 cloud. But if not, we're a sitting duck, we're going to cast you off in the Bay of Biscay radio position and we're going to try and make a run for it. And, and that's this starts on the 3rd of June, 43. Bearing in mind, we're going to go on July the 8th. Um, you can see there by the 7th of July, there are 27 horses in theatre, which is no bad effort. And uh, a lot of the guys who flew this mission, and I used to talk to Mike Hall a lot, just, just didn't view it as anything big. They said, yeah, it was a great long flight. You know, it was nothing spectacular. But if you were one of the guys who ditched and uh, was shot down and uh, or ditched, then it was a real thing. One one crew spent eleven days in the dinghy, uh, and event, before they were eventually picked up by uh, Portuguese fishermen, and they got themselves back to Madrid of all places to get home. And there was some diplomatic mix, mix up because when they got to the train station in Madrid, the uh, it was the German ambassador who was there to meet them, not the British ambassador. So that was okay. a bit of an awkward moment, I would think. Um, and one crew was lost over Africa and was never found. So, yeah, so it's a whole story on its own. Somebody should write a book about it, just this on its own, uh, Beggar, Turkey Buzzard. It, it's, a, it's a phenomenal feat of airmanship, which not a lot of people talk about. And, you know, and, and the, the Halifax crews work absolute wonders to coax every ounce of juice and fuel out of those aircraft to get them there and keep going back. And if you think they also have to do the trials on the engines, the oil, carry extra oil, and, and forward base all the spares and oil and fuel in Morocco and Tunisia to allow them to, keep those 10 Halifaxes circling this route. Wow. Great. Amazing achievement, as you say. But, yeah, um, it is, yeah. Moving so, along. So, yeah, so they were intercepted on, this is one of the, this is footage from a JU-88. Uh, it shoots down the Halifax. As you can see there, that's cannon shells going in the right-hand photograph to one of the Halifaxes of 29 Squadron, 295 Squadron. Uh, and then the next slide, please, is the, is one of the, one of the horses goes in and they're told the hawser is not to be captured. It is to be destroyed no matter what happens. 
The problem is it's wood and it floats and it won't sink. <laughs> and they, they they get the escape axe, they try sinking it. They, they cl- for, it's great for a while because they're on top and they can get the dinghy out and the survival pack, etc. And then along comes a Navy frigate. And the Navy frigate um, tries to ram it. It won't sink. They open fire the four-inch gun on it. It won't sink. And in the end, they just steam off and give up. So it's... Uh, it's probably still out there somewhere. I was going to say, it's still out there. People, people, yeah. 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 Uh, next time I'm down there, I'll have a little look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. But moving on to, to Labrook. So Labrook, here we are. Here we can see uh, a wacko in all its glory, still wearing its white star markings, and notice the trestle under the tail. So you put the trestle under the tail to load yeah. the uh, the Jeep in, and then you take the trestle away. Uh, and you can see how small it is compared to all of that. It's a very different kind of aircraft altogether. Yeah. Uh, it's good good for what it's designed for, but it's not really what we would want. So Labrook is is the first operation, as we said. So let's move on. And we're going to talk about troop carriers here, the Americans, 51st US troop carrier, who get a terrible reputation after this operation. And, and, and there are incidents, and even their own commander general, Ray Dunn, says some crews turned away. But you fly, you are fresh out of training, Many of them are ex-airline pilots who can, who've been drafted. Some were straight straight out of training. And they're, they're not specialists in towing gliders. Uh, one of the squadrons was, but the rest weren't. They were trained to carry freight, medivac, drop paratroopers, all these different things. Um, and you're flying DC-3s, which have no self-sealing fuel tanks, no armour, no navigation aids, uh, no really good navigation aids that you need. And in some cases, some of the formations of nine aircraft only had one trained navigator. So wow. like like the glider pilot regiment, these guys have been thrown in at the deep end very early in the war. It's a new capability. And after what happens in Sicily happens, Eisenhower is constantly monitoring what's going on with Troop Carrier Command because he, you know, he knows he's going to need them for Normandy and how critical they are uh, for airborne forces and for everything else he uses them for. So I think... They get a bad press, and let's not forget there are a load of American glider pilots who came to instruct and, and actually flew on the op with the British guys, with, with British co-pilots. Uh, no doubt some did some did turn away and flew away, away from the flak and even dumped. One one glider was, was dropped, cast off, and landed at Malta and thought they were in Sicily, surrounded by the RAF regiment. One, some of them were dropped back in North Africa, and they crew to tow, tow aircraft didn't know where they were either so that's just a level of lack of training etc so but uh, they did what they could this is the plan so you can see that the headings there that are going to take having crossed their gliders over the um atlas mountains and there's a few incidents there where some of the glided pilots flew their own flew their test flight before they went over the atlas mountains cast off and landed back on in morocco and said I'm not happy with my glider. There's something wrong with the handling. And uh, a chat, uh, Hopkinson gets in the glider, flies it, says nothing wrong with it, sends them back to UK, sacks them, basically. So there's, there's a bit of a friction thing going on with Hopkinson and, and the regiment as such. He's got very clear views on what should happen. Uh, so you can see the plan is basically fly to Malta, low level, sea level, wave top height at night. And when you get to Malta, there'll be some cross search lights to tell you where you are. Then you turn off another heading and you fly across to the bottom right and tip of Sicily, Syracuse, to do Operation Labrook, which we'll talk about in detail. But you can see here the circuit that the uh, tug aircraft are being asked to fly. The American 51st Troop Carrier Command will tow all the wackos. The hawsers will be towed by 38 wing because the uh, they, it's perceived that their training is superior and they've got a navigator in every aircraft and they know what they're doing. And the hawsers are the vital aircraft because they're going to be the coup de main on the anti-tank weapon, right. so they have to get there. So, uh, so that's the split as far as that goes. Okay. So this is the landing zones. You can see um, landing zone three, north and south, are the coup de main in the, in the top of the picture there, and landing zone one and two are for uh, the um, Syracuse, the town itself, and, and uh, to reinforce the Ponte Grande bridge. Whole idea being that. Um, southwest of here and, and southeast of here, amphibious forces will come ashore and whiz up the road that's been secured with the bridges completely, the big bridge, Ponte Grande, secured by the South Staffords and, uh, and the, the telephone exchange, the harbour. They've all got objectives, which in if they've been fighting against the Germans, there's no way they would have used such light forces or thought they might get away with it. You can see the plan there broken down, South, uh, South Staffs, 
capture the Ponta Grande about midnight, land the main for- landing force follows on, deal with the coastal battery en route, and then secure the whole area. The borders will reinforce us. So two battalions, not three. And was there much cooperation and consultation about the choice of landing zones and flight paths? I mean, was everybody involved in it? or or Yeah, there is. uh, And Chatterton is offered the chance to fly over in a bow fighter and uh, and, um, doesn't like what he sees. And you can see marked on the map there, and I've I've walked this ground many times. It's crisscrossed with low stone walls because they're orchards. And um, it's absolutely the worst possible place on Earth you could land a glider. Right. Right. Probably, and this is the controversy that comes in with hindsight, is actually maybe paratroopers might have been better here and fustian to the north might have been more suitable for gliders. If you okay. Choose. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Well, well yeah. Hopkinson, yeah. Hops, Hopkinson wants the uh, landing brigade here and he wants his glider landing to be the first bit. Mm. So it's a bit of friction, which we'll come on to now. Yeah, indeed. So Chatterton, here he is, George. Um and this, this is a quote from him. Uh, so you sign it, kind of get an impression here of the contrast between him and Rock. Rock's charismatic. I'll do everything. You know, I'll, I've done the same same course, same course as you. Whereas Chatterton is a fighter pilot. He's he's a guardsman. He's big buddies with Boy Browning. They went to Eton together, and Chatterton taught Browning to fly. So when you see Dirk Bogard wearing his flying wings, he, he actually did have those wings. Uh, and it was Chatterton that chose him. Um, so, okay, so uh, he is a no-nonsense leader and wants to forge this, rep- this regiment into a weapon, as we can see. But he has a problem because he doesn't like what he sees when he sees the plan. As a pilot, he understands landing a glider because he flies gliders in this environment is not, it's just not going to be a pleasant experience. It's going to lose a lot of guys and maybe the mission might fail. And he tackles Hopkinson about this if we could move on a bit. A bit. So he, and he, he raises his concerns. And this is a page on the right here from the op order itself. Um, and uh, there, there's been photo recce as well. And there are some models made. So people know. So, so he raises these experiences. I'll just run them through them very briefly. When the guys have built their gliders in Morocco, and flown them, they've accrued on average a total of four hours flying on that type, having not flown for six months in some cases. Only one hour of that is night flying. And they're going to be asked to fly across the Mediterranean at wave top height and find a, a landing zone at night. He's got a, a, he hasn't got enough pilots. Luckily, the US Army Air Force guys will say, step up and say, we'll fly, we'll do it. Good, pretty gutsy for them. He's concerned about troop carrier command and their inexperience. And to be to be fair, 38 wing, you know, they've not done this before either. There are issues, as I mentioned earlier, with the Waco and the Albemol. Yeah. Although so but most of the Wacos are being towed by C 47s Um he's concerned about the accuracy of the Met forecast, and the Met forecast itself is for high winds, gusting winds, and it's and the area is renowned for that. Strong headwinds, which will affect the release height. And this yeah. is one of the things that goes wrong on the night is there's no adjustment or there's no communication out to the airfields in Tunisia to change the height. And there's a lot of friction between the American Troop Carrier Command General, General Ray Dunn, who said we should have raised the release height by 2,000 feet because this, the American crews have been told because of the, the vulnerability of their aircraft, they can't fly over land. They've got to cast the gliders off at sea for them to fly in and make the coast, make land for themselves. And then there's the, the walls, the trees, the bunkers, and then, and of course, then there's the enemy. Yeah. So Chatterton goes into bat with, with Hopkinson and says, you know, I'm really not happy with, with this. And uh, Hopkinson says, well, I'll, I'll, no problem, George. I'll arrange for you to have a, a, a recce. You can, you can go in a bow fighter. He goes off in a Royal Australian Air Force bow fighter. Doesn't see anything. It's too dark. Weather's too bad. Comes back. Still not happy. And according to Chatterton's memoirs and to people who are around the peripheral of this, Chatterton says to Hopkinson, I, we can't do this. The, the regiment's not up to it. And Hopkinson says, well, I'll tell you what, George, I'm going to leave the room, go for a walk. I'll be back in half an hour. And uh, if you're not here, I'll find someone who'll command the regiment. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Well, Chatterton, your dilemma is 
do you stay and do what you can or do you make a protest and walk away on what is the first ever large scale operation and use of British gliders in, in World War II? So, and, and the bad feeling, I mean, I remember when I first joined the Army Air Corps, there was still a lot of these guys around and they would talk about Chatterton with bile because of what happened. And others would mm. defend him. They had no choice and the, the rock thing. And so, and Chatterton was, def, tried to defend himself as well quite often. Wow. It's a tough call, that. Yeah, tough yeah, call. it is. It is. So next. Yeah. So here we can see what the what the plan was. Um, and this is, this links in. You can see the uh, the right-hand side, there's a gun battery, Capo Mulco de Porco. That's Paddy Main and his guys coming ashore there. The SRS. And, uh, and then First Airborne come in. And the approach track, as you can see, is quite a way offshore uh, for LZ1 and LZ2. And then it's supposed to so turn around and come back. So you can see it's almost 5Ks if you put your thumb on the map. Uh, and in the dark, with poor navigation, that's great with no headwind. But a headwind means that a lot of the gliders are going to come down in the in the sea if they're not let off properly. And I've already mentioned some of these things. There's no combat experience. A lot of the crews, the C-47, DC-3 crews, are, are spooked by the flak. And Ray Dunn says that in his own post-operational report. They've never seen flak before. They've never been fired at before. Some of it's nowhere near them, but they think it is because they don't understand it. Uh, no cockpit armour. No, no. And there's a shortage of ground crew for battle damage repair. So they're, they're told we can't risk damage to the aircraft because we've got no one to repair them because we're, we're operating at reach away from our logistics in the North African desert. So there's a lot of dilemmas here. There's a lot of things. Mm. So this is why I think this is only 11 months before Normandy, guys. You know, and uh, this is the birth of airborne forces for the Allies because we all know 82nd Airborne are having just a torrid of time on the other flank being shot out of yeah. the sky by their own flak. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so training. So what have they done? They do uh, a few exercises before they go, uh, some limited flying, uh, but mainly the, the mission rehearsals are done with trucks. The glider pilots in the trucks, practicing one staying in the cab, one getting the troops out the back, one pointing and telling them which way to go. Um, and they, you can see exercise E2 um, is at night fly. Only 12 wackos fly on that one. Um, and then there's the, the flight over the WAC, over the Atlas Mountain. So if you, you're trying to learn how to fly a new aircraft you've never flown before, let's just go over the, the Atlas Mountain, shall we? Where some aircraft drop as far as 2,000 feet in one drop because of the wind currents and turbulence. Um, so it's it's quite a it's quite a story. It is quite a story. Um, I mean, and, and I just want to thank you, Mike, just for, for for doing this because you know I've read Sicily books where they the historians are just basically critical of of troop carrier command critical of the glider pilot performance uh, without really going into much detail about all these these elements and uh, and now i'm hearing it from you it's it, it, there's a there's a huge huge l l series of l problems that they have to overcome yeah. but it's I even to, even to to begin to be a success they've got to overcome lots of potential pitfalls yeah and I, 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 when i did the sicily book well, when I did the Arnhem book, I wanted to do the Sicily book first, and nobody would publish it. No one's interested in Sicily, even though it's the 80th anniversary this year now, and hopefully it'll be more interesting because it, it, it's um, it needs it needs to be more more exposed to what's gone on here. Because when you get to the island, I've, I've done a lot of tours of Sicily. There's so much to see and so much to learn, and this is just a small part of it. Yeah. But it shape it shapes now. You know Normandy intimately. It shapes airborne tactics when they come to the Normandy. Well, absolutely. I mean, we go down a rabbit hole of, you know, how many times do people say Dieppe is the learning curve for not for, for Normandy? And it's irrelevant in terms of the learning curve. It's all about Husky. It's all about, well, and, and North Africa, I suppose. It, 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 it's right, because the amphibious lessons learned at Husky are huge. Yeah. Huge. Uh, so uh, so let's move on. Yeah. So the, the big kingpin, that, that now this is, this is what people talk about Pegasus Bridge. This is something on another league. This is Ponte Grande Bridge, which is a similar concept. Six gliders to take off and, and, and seize the Ponte Grande Bridge in a coup de main, put their nose through the barbed wire, land next to the bridge. And this is this is from War Illustrated. The, the, the glider landed nowhere near the bridge, but uh, it's, it's, it's within walking distance. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it's key. It's a key mission. So let's move, move to the next slide. So here's here's it. Here we've got the, 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 we've got eight halls of gliders, 
Toad by seven out Halifax and one album I'll remember there were only ten Halifax, so there's servicing and everything like here. So one album I'll which can just about lug a fully laden hawser into the air, just with and there's headwinds and all those issues. So there's carrying four platoons of A Company, four platoons of C Company, and the mission commander is the is the company commander from the South Staffs, and the glider pilot commander is is uh, one of the flight commanders. And they they've had they've had some practice, they've got there's, there's plenty of orders and, and rehearsals and models, etc. But the crews are flying, unlike Pegasus Bridge, where they have 30 plus rehearsal mission flights. No, there are no rehearsal flights, none of that. Um, so let's move on. So this is what happens to those gliders who are all being towed by 38 wing, as we've just heard. Um, and there's various disasters along the way, and you can see. Um, one two eight ditches in the sea uh, because of tow rope snaps. Uh, one two nine, ten miles from the landing zones, not going to affect the battle. One thirty ditch, one three one ditch because of headwinds. Uh, Seventeen platoon, we'll talk about in a minute, it's destroyed. And landing zone three, one makes it, which is uh, fifteen platoon, and then the other two don't make it either. So, and that that's with the better better tug crews. Yeah. So when we talk, when you fast forward to to Tonga and Mallard and and Pegasus Bridge, you can see why there's the, the way they load the gliders and the way they go for each of the two Pegasus. And I've got to mention Hawser Bridge as well. You know, just so it's, course, it's important. Yeah. Uh, and the guys who fly this mission are, are influence that and how it's done. Yeah. Definitely. So Glider 133, the glider that makes it. So this is this is an epic, epic story. And um, more people need to know about this. Uh, and um, this is Staff Sergeant Dennis Galpin and Sergeant Nigel Brown. And they're in the front. And 23-year-old Lieutenant Len Withers is in the back with in command of 15 platoon. Luckily for them, their tug pilot is Flight Lieutenant Tommy Grant, who's a Boscombe Down pilot. He's been involved in all those trials. He's done he's done the uh, op beggar flights, etc. But it's his first ever night tow. And when he gets into his these, these Halifaxes have been hammered up and down to North Africa and back across the desert over the Arctic. He's got a faulty compass. His autopilot is US. He's got oh, he's got problems with three of his engines out of the four, and he, he decides that he's got no choice. He's got to abort the mission and re, and return to base, and he goes back to Airfield E. And then when he gets he's in the circuit at the at the return airfield, suddenly all the engines come online and start working. So he gets on the on the field telephone back to the glider and says to Galpin and and to Withers, "Okay, we we can go if you still want to go. We can turn now and go." And they elect to go, which means they're going to arrive out of the stream on their own unaware of what's happened to any of the other gliders. So um, they do they do exactly that. And as they approach the landing zone uh, off the coast of Sicily, they're caught in searchlights and uh, are under fire. So um, Gal uh, sorry, um, Grant's aircraft is hit. One of the engines is on fire at one point. And uh, he says, we're going to have to, what do you want to do? Uh, because the, the glider has been riddled with fire. So they turn back out to sea and Galpin and Withers have a quick conflab and say, we'll patch the wounded up, we'll, we'll go again. And they turn around, they fly back in out of the darkness, again back into searchlights. And this time the glider is locked in the searchlights. Galpin casts off. And get this, get this then. So Grant then flies his aircraft so that his gunner can fire at the searchlight. A four-engined Halifax. So to cover to cover Galpin's approach. Galpin dives and is locked in in the searchlight fire. So he's at um, he's at about fifteen hundred feet, and he can't he can't shake the searchlight. So you're in a glider, you've got no engines, you're on your way down. You don't know what to do. So what Galpin does is he he says, "I'll turn back out to sea with no engines." Turns back out to sea into the darkness, and then turns around, shoots another approach into the into the uh, into the bridge. Luckily for him. I don't, know, I don't know a lot about searchlights, but when, when they calibrate the bearing of where they are, some, they bring them down to the ground onto a known object and then go back up to get their bearings. And the Italians come down, and as they do that, they illuminate the bridge. Galpin sees Galpin and Brown see the bridge and make their swoop and get to landing zone three and land on landing zone three. Okay, so next, next slide. I, I've been to Ponte Grande, and when I was looking at the, the drop zone compared to the bridge i was th you know it, it it did remind me of pegasus bridge yeah the, the, yeah the the restrictions and the, the just the 
the feet, the feet, the aviation feet. Uh, yeah, yes. incredible. Yeah, absolutely. But with no training, no rehearsals. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing what they did. No arrest of parachutes, none of that. So, um, and I'm not do I'm not undermining what happened to Pegasus Bridge. It's a fantastic. It is a great feat of ownership, but I just think this deserves a little bit more credit than it gets. So yeah, then Pegasus we're... Bridge is 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 a is a testament to the as we said as you've been saying to the training to the to the yeah. rigid adherence to lots and lots of practice, lots and lots of intelligence. The the, the sand tables, the all that stuff. There, this is more about instinctive. Uh, skill skills, isn't it? As a as oh, yeah, opposed yeah, no, to I, trial I, I, preparation. I, um, in 1994, I, I ran the Army Air Corps study there with with four of the pilots, uh, and they they told me each told me their version of what had happened, and they all to a man said that the moonlight was so bright it's, we could have yeah. flown we found that bridge in, in no problem at all. You know, um, but this is a different scenario yeah, really. altogether. So this is Len with us, 23, lands with glider 133. Nose wheels ripped off. Galpin and Brown have got it, got him there, and uh, he starts to shake his platoon out of the uh, his platoon side and starts getting the guys out of the glide. He's got a couple of guys who are wounded, etc. But and he, he knows where the bridge is. He's he's made it. He looks around. There's no other gliders. So then, out of, out of the darkness, in comes the other glider. The company command, and he sees from the chalk mark on the side, wow, it's the company commander's glider. Thank God for that. So that's got the senior glider pilot on board and the company commander. At that point, Tracer rips into that glider and hits, we think, the Bangalore torpedoes and explosives all under the seat the sappers are carrying, and that explodes in midair, killing everybody. So you see, the only other glider that's made it is, is destroyed on the landing zone. So you're 23 years old, and you, you and your platoon side look at each other, what should we do? So it's a mission for eight gliders, a company assault, and you've got one platoon. He says, we'll attack. So he takes takes about four or five of his guys, and it rather it, exactly like um, like Pegasus Bridge, they've landed on one side of the bridge, and they need to get both ends at once. So he says, we'll swim the river, what's the canal, and when, when you hear us attack the other end, you attack the, the, the other end. And they do exactly that, and they, they route a garrison of about 80 Italians and capture the bunkers, the machine, the machine gun bunkers around it, take it, take it, and capture the bridge. In the middle of the, what's it, by this stage, a disastrous night for First Airborne. Yeah, yeah. A disastrous night. And uh, he will spend the next 24 hours clinging onto that bridge and being almost driven back into the sea. And most of them will be taken prisoner, only to be rescued at the last minute by the land component as they come up from the beach. So... Uh, there's no Piper Bill Millen, but there's, it's a good story. <laughs> it is an amazing story, and, and thanks for sharing it with us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, so moving on to the analysis of the whole of the whole operation. Yeah, you can see there. So it, the mission starts with 144 gliders, six locations. Uh, 75 Hadrians go in the water. Three hawsers go in the water. Uh, 61, sorry, Wacko's Hadrians are scattered over 25 miles around the landing zone. Glider 133, which you've heard about, makes it. Two horses are hit by flak and explode. And the, the, the number of glider pilots who do find the landing zones who have broken legs and shattered elbow, and shattered ankles, is, is staggering. And all of the accounts and all the interviews I did at the time talked talk about the, the noise they could hear from these guys just lying in there, trapped in their cockpits, or what was left of their cockpits, being having been having their legs smashed to pieces. Um, three out of the six, six pounders that needed to be, to get, be brought on land, make it, and four out of nine Jeeps. Uh, and the problem then manifests itself that the WACO cannot carry the gun and the Jeep together. So right, those units yes. that are doing that, the, the chances of those two WACOs landing in the same landing zone, in the same grid square, in the same mile five-mile box are zero. So you've got the mobility issue of, of doing that. But they they managed to get a, it's, it's a... It's a disastrous night for First Airborne, but they, they managed to cling on. And um, capture the Ponte Grande and capture Syracuse. Um, so yeah. So you can see the breakdown here: two hundred and fifty-two drowned. Mm. Uh, it's a it's an amazing amount when you think that's not combat. That's just before mm. the before mm. that, even getting there. So you can see the paranoia that comes in for for Normandy after this. Uh, well, I mean, because we 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 talk about Lee Mallory and his, you know, his ri yeah. well, not ridiculously, but his very yeah. negative seventy yeah. percent of all airborne force will be killed by avoiding the ground. Look at this. Look at this. 
But looking yeah, yeah. at that, that you know, it, it's it's not. He didn't pluck that out of his ass. You know, he, he's he. You know, okay, he's not directly involved in in this, but you know, he's got the data. He's he's Air Marshal Lee Mallory, so yeah, you can yeah. absolutely understand the, the 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 hesitancy prior to Overlord about the use of of airborne forces on mass. Yeah, and, and, and I'm not. I'm, let's not distract too much from the, the actual fighting. There's some really vicious fighting around Monte yeah, Grande. Yeah. And this composite force of glider pilots, senior officers, engineers, medics, American pilots, they, they cling on to that bridge to the last moment. And then they're pushed off it, taken prisoner, and then the Allied forces arrive in time to rescue them. So uh, and the bridge is captured again. Um, so it, it's quite a it's quite an escapade. It really is a story. And, but for the first air landing brigade, and, and think about those pilots that do survive and those people that do swim, they're picked up by ships and taken to Malta, yeah. Egypt. Yeah. So the brigade is scattered around the Mediterranean immediately after the operation. So, and it's supposed to be ready for subsequent operations. It, it, it isn't. And it won't be. So okay. Leslie is asking, what was Churchill's reaction to all this? Uh, he he viewed it as a, he he had Browning in his ear, saying, "You know, what a brave thing." So it's almost like the Montgomery ninety percent successful. Mm. You know, we kept, we got the bridge. So his his view was, you know, it, it's it's our first use of airborne forces. They, they achieved their mission, didn't they? Well, yeah, I mean, so. and, he, and he's not wrong in that. If you yeah. in that sense, yeah. I mean, as you said, they're holding on to Ponte Grande. They did hold it on onto yeah. it with against the odds. So it, it's paradoxically, it is showing what airborne forces can achieve, yeah. and it's also showing how airborne forces can suffer badly just being delivered there. So it's 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 doing both things at the same time. Yeah, we tend to gloss over the risk with airborne forces because we're so used to the successes. But we think about this. We think about Arnhem. You think about all these other things. It, yeah. It's it's a it's a it's a throw of the dice. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. But moving okay. on because we're 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 um, Fustian. Yeah, so Fustian uh, not not talked about much. Um, it's a parachute drop. It's first parachute brigade. So it's Frost and his boys. Uh, it's three and, and there's a, there's there's a lot of troop carrier controversy around this. Alistair Pearson, CEO of Third Battalion, pulling his pistol on his pilot to make him fly him over the drop zone and all the rest of it. There's, and the gliders do very well. This is this is the Merville battery of the day of, of the yeah. of the yeah, yeah. campaign, where the gliders flying under fire get six pounds in. And if you whatever your view on Chatterton and his total soldier thing, and the myth, whether it's a myth or not, the glider pilots that enjoying this battle uh, operate the anti tank guns because the gunners are nearly all wounded or killed, and uh, and, and also take over a German eighty eight and turn it on Germans and, and use it. That's the glider pilots, not the parachute regiment guys. It's all the gunners. So it does show their adaptability. And Gavin will, will write, when we talk about Arnhem, Gavin writes after, after Arnhem, I want my glider pilots trained like the British ones because then they become a, a, a positive impact after they've flown, not a, not a negative one. Um, so Primicelli Bridge is, is, a, is a real old slog between German Falschenjäger and British Airborne. Uh, and I said talking to you earlier about coming back and doing this as a separate thing because they, they drop on exactly the same drop zones and uh, in amongst each other. And it's the only time when both sides parachute in and fight each other. Every, usually one's already on the ground, but these guys pa both parachute in to, to fight. So Christian, yeah, is uh, it's a success. Glutton was cancelled because Taranto was captured by... Paddy May and his boys by sea, and the, the uh, after firing a couple of cursory rounds, the admiral, the Italian admiral in charge of Taranto, surrendered the, surrendered the port. Mm. Okay. So thanks again to Matt Yates for this one. This is the uh, Roll of Honor, uh, and we'll more about that in a minute. But you can see here the, the casualties. From, um, so the, so next slide. Sorry, not casualties. Those are talk about. Here are the casualties. So, yeah. So that's one of the headstones from uh, Syracuse Cemetery and Army Air Corps. That doesn't mean that they're glider pilots. They could be parachute regiment. They could be anything. Um, the date would suggest that they're not. So you can see they're uh, killed, wounded, missing uh, for for the regiment. And, and then there's also the on on that week for the weeks afterwards because everyone's scattered around the Mediterranean. There's no way of knowing actually how many are dead until long afterwards. And when they do get brought back to North Africa to, re, to re, uh, re, regroup and recoup, they're put under the command of Shan Hackett because Shan Hackett hasn't deployed because his operation was cancelled. 
and he he locks them in their camps because he said they were looking for American blood, thinking that it was, it was true carry command's fault. They've been dropped in the sea and they've lost so many so many of their mates, etc. And that, that begins a long association between Shan Hackett and the Glider Pirate Regiment. He ends up as uh, their patron after the war and writes the foreword for a lot of the histories, etc. He's a great admirer and, and, and fights with them at Arnhem, obviously. Okay. So, Total Soldiers, that's my favourite picture on the right there of uh, sort of Major Masson with his tattoos and his, his armlet with a 38 wing pilot. There. You can see. When they're on ops, they're working together, which is how it used to be in the modern army. We never got together unless we were on ops, but now we're a lot more together than they were. So this is one slide. You can see Chapton gets the DSO. But look at the – there's a number of AFCs there for beggar. Yep. Army flying medals because obviously soldiers got medals there, not crosses. And then look, MC, DFC, DCM, DFC, DFC, DFC. And then the next next slide, another load. and um, DFMs, yep. So what I'm going to pick out, Ben, it's just a random one. There's a few. I'll pick out John Ainsworth, second from the bottom, military medal. Ainsworth's glider ditches in the sea. He swims ashore without any of his equipment, apart from his, his airborne fighting knife, kills an Italian sentry with a knife, kills a second Italian with a knife, takes the weapon and takes almost uh, yeah 30-plus 30, 30 Italians prisoner having stormed a bunker on his own. But starts off with a knife to do that. So that's sort of um, what you get. And, and Chatterton ends up with uh, Paddy Main mm. as a, a, a composite company. Pa, you know, the uh, deputy commander of the brigade is in charge at um, Ponte Grande Bridge. So all these guys are involved in the battle. And, and that's why I always said the Arnhem book was so difficult to write because the glider pilots are in every bit of the battle. You're not just following one unit. They end up everywhere. But look at those the number of military crosses and military medals there for always a huge... Sacrifice. So I do think they were total soldiers when you think they could drive Jeeps, use radios, all the rest of it. But I would say that I never, ever, in all the years I worked at Glider, ever heard them use the word elite or special or say they were. Well, I've heard other people who were that colour berry say that kind of thing. I never heard a Glider pilot say that. Uh, I, I think of elite as very much being a, a modern to post war. Yeah. Uh, what, what word we attribute back to World War, and I hate it because what does it mean? Does it mean well trained? Does it mean performance? It's you know, people refer fine. to the hundred and first day as elite before they've even seen combat. What is it? Is yeah. elite a mindset? It's a it's a rabbit hole. But yeah, yeah it's I agree. that they didn't use it. But the, the important thing is is that is the lessons learned. Were, were well, not what they, the lessons clearly should be learned. Were they learned? The, yeah, they were. Um, yeah. Almost. I mean, Chatterton went into the sea. Um, in the same glider as Pip Hicks. Pip Hicks swam, swam ashore. Uh, he would be, you know, oldest man at Arnhem. So one le lesson they did, did need to learn was about tactical loading because they had the squadron commander, the regimental co brigade commander and divisional commander all in the same glider. Um, and tr mainly, the, mainly it was about the use of troop carrying aircraft. The, the, the absolute critical need for accurate MET forecasting and comes to airfields because that height adjustment for the cast off that was never passed but yeah you know, and there's no record of it actually being written down anywhere so it's all the no yes of course we told you and that's why there's that grit between the true carrier command and and uh, after after sicily uh no british glider was ever towed by an american tug right okay 38 wing and 46 wing did it did it all the group sorry um although and the but you know although if we look at arnhem as an example the only british paratroopers that jumped from raf aircraft with the pathfinders everyone else jumped from american c-47s dc-3s mm, true yeah um, yeah, yeah. So the confidence in them i, I think they get a, a very bad press both sides yeah. when you look at the mitigated circumstances of what they did they did to achieve the mission given all of these things that have happened it was phenomenal so what lessons were learned let's move on to the next slide Oops, sorry. Uh, there we are. Sorry, there we go. Yeah, so so Chatterton uh, gets gets survives uh, and it doesn't know what to do. He thinks this is the end of the air landing brigade. This is the end of the glider pirate regiment. This is the end of our air airborne capability. Browning's not there. He's in the UK. Hopkinson is on the island somewhere, running around shooting people and being a soldier. So he remembers he's got a bottle of whiskey buried in the sand near his tent goes and digs it up and then goes and sees Ray Dunn, the commander of the 51st Troop Carrier Command, 
and says, can I, can I, do you want to share my whiskey? And they spend the night and they do this bottle of whiskey and decide what went wrong between the two of them. And uh, Chatterton is determined he's got to get back to the UK before the news uh, and, and get to the war office and get to Browning and get to, to Churchill if he can. And he needs, he needs support. And, and Dunn, who's a one-star general, gives him a, a full colonel's American uniform, a, a, a pass, an ID, to get him on the American transport system to get him back to UK. And also, Chatterton asks him for the support of a, a senior general. Dunn says, uh, which one? And he says, Eisenhower. <laughs> so Chatterton comes back. And what does he do? He, um, he realises that it, they need to stop being battalions. They need to be wings. So one wing and two wing glider pilot regiment are formed. That the glider pilots need to live on the same airfields as the tugs that tow them. So 38 wing and the two glider pilot wings need to share airfields. They need to live in the same messes. They need to train together. That the glider pilots need to fly in the tugs whenever they're, they're not flying the gliders. More and more training needs mass formation. They need night flying training. Basically, they need to do it all properly again and goes back and does that. He goes away and decides that, yes, they need they need to be do all the military training. So he brings the battle, raises the battle schools again. And all kinds of changes are made to, to the structure and reorganisation. And he organises headquarters glider pilots, glider pilot regiment, and there's the two, one and two wing with their own regiment, their own CO commanders, and uh, intrinsically links them to the transport command. Mm. Uh, so, and works and works and works to train and develop more more pilots and more better technology, more and just basically lots, lots more training. And, and as we said with Kevin yesterday, th th there was no, never a, a, a desire to throw the baby out with a bathwater. I mean, you know, the Germans, as you said earlier, after Crete, they just kind of go, no more. They just simply yeah. use Felsch Omega and what have you as ground troops and gliders for cargo. But yeah. there's ne you know, th there's obviously the, the British, the Commonwealth, realise there's something here. It just needs it needs improvement, not abandoning. Oh, if you're going to get across the channel, yeah, you, you need a foothold first before the amphibious forces get there. And this yeah. is the only yeah. way you can do it. So you need to think... What have we learned from that? What can we do? Yeah. And how okay. can we improve? And, uh, you know, I, and I just say that Sicily is 80 years this year. It really does need to be thought about a lot more. And I think you mentioned Dieppe earlier. This is the lesson. These are the lessons for Normandy, I think, personally. There are a few small lessons to be learned from combined ops and Dieppe, but there's far more to be learned from, it, from not just this element, but the amphibious element and the fighting in land that goes on afterwards. Because you've got a whole set of armies here who've been fighting in the open desert suddenly find themselves in built-up areas, fighting off beaches, uh, fighting in mountains and, and, and all the rest of it. So with a civilian population around, which they didn't have in the desert. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, that's, I've got to say thanks to a few people for who've helped me out with this. There they are. Um, who've helped me along the way with this, the photographs and some of the stuff I've got. So um, that's that. Uh, well, no, thank you for that. And thank you, everybody there on the list there. So um, brilliant stuff. We will, we've, 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 It's been a long one, but obviously we, rec we we suggest your books. There are links to your books in the description below, folks, and you can contact Mike on Twitter. There's his, there's his handle there. But, yeah, all worth getting, all worth exploring. But we'll, we'll, we'll do a couple of questions if that's okay with you, Mike. So, no, so Ian Carr is asking about uh, the, the two men in the gliders, uh, you know, staff sergeant and sergeant. Were there any particular specialist skills the second man had that that, that were unique to him? No, no, they, they had distinct roles when they landed. So the the, the both trained pilots. Just it's just the number of hours. So the staff sergeant being number one pilot, first pilot, second pilot being a sergeant. So when they landed, the, the task was for the the second pilot was to get the troops out and, and divert, send them off in the right direction to make sure they got out of the aircraft. But they, it's both equal equal partners in flying the aircraft. One's the aircraft commander, one isn't. Um, so no distinct skills. I mean, when you look at Texas Bridge again, you've got two staff sides up front and one's doing the map reading compasses, et cetera. There's not a lot of that to do in a glider because you've not got that far to go. Okay. Um, it's it's about it's about physically handling the glider because it's a big old beast with no hydraulics very well, very much air brakes, and that's it. So um, Big War Games is asking, who does Mike rate as the best glider pilot regiment officer? I don't know whether he means commander or officer generally, but is there, a, is, you know, the chat, not necessarily the Chatterton Rock argument, but is there some other figure that you think? Yeah, the guy, it's funny, yeah, the guy, the guy in the photograph on the screen now who's lying down in front of the moustache, that's Frank Barkley. Right. Who's 
just a great, great bloke. You read about some of these guys who are just phenomenal officers and that list of medals, but really the best glider pilot officer I ever met and was a great friend was Mike Dauncey. Uh, who was the glider pilot regiment Victoria Cross that never was, or should have been. So when he wounded three times at Arnhem, absolute gentleman, and he was recommended for the VC. And when I did the research for the Arnhem book, I found um, uh, the citation, which VC had been crossed out, DSO written in place, initialed Bernard Law Montgomery. And uh, when he went to get his DSO, from the king um browning because mike daunty was a second pilot browning cut off his own first pilot's wings and sent them to him said you you needed to wear these you're now first pilot it's a little bit of humanity there from browning which is, challenges the dirt boat burger perception of him you know, for the yeah trail. yeah yeah but well, i think mike, mike daunty a machine gun officer defends the gun line in in you know he's his lieutenant commands composite platoon five foot nothing fantastic man Brilliant. We'll do a couple more quick ones and then we'll leave it at that and we'll bring you back. So Willie Robertson is asking, were the Operation Beggar Horses towed to North Africa empty or did they transport any cargo? Really good question. Uh, they actually carried their undercarriage inside, a spare set of undercarriage, because to make them streamlined, because the horse was always designed to jettison its undercarriage. I'm sure Kevin mentioned that yesterday. Uh, so they, they flew to reduce drag with no undercarriage. So in the back, they carried a spare set of undercarriage to, to, to be fitted once they'd landed in uh, North Africa. There was limited spares, but no, not not they weren't used for, for big movements of freight or anything like that. Okay, two more quick ones. One from Alex Beeman there is asking, uh, was the rear gunner, this is in the Halifax, I guess, yeah. playing telephone between the glider pilot and the tow pilot, or did it go directly to the tow pilot? Uh, it, was the, it was the gunner. Right. Okay, that was a nice quick one. And then... Katie Way, who I think is Greg Way, who's coming on a Friday talking about the German glider. What was the background of initial glider trainers? Did they have sport gliding background in the 1930s? Another really good question. Yeah, it is a good question. Uh, nowhere near as much as the German in Germany. Right, uh, okay. There were a few who'd flown before, but most were soldiers who just decided they want to fly. Uh, I'm going to do something different. Brilliant. Well, I think we will leave things there, and I think people will just be badgering me about when I can bring you back on to go into more detail and we can decide when that will be and what you'll be talking about. But what an amazing, amazing uh, 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 show. Thank you very much, Mike. I, I, I've learned a lot and I thought I already knew a little bit about glider pilots, but I now know a hell of a lot more. So thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Good. Brilliant. So folks, join us again tomorrow. We're hearing about the American pilots tomorrow, which will be really fascinating with Scott McGough based on his book uh, about the flying coffin. So that'd be fantastic. So thank you everybody for your questions. Thank you very everybody for watching and don't forget to check those links out to Mike's books and his Twitter page. And if you've got more questions, perhaps he'll follow up on Twitter for you. So yeah. thanks everybody. Thanks Mike. Cheers everybody. Thank I'll you. see you all tomorrow. Bye.